6.4 and said it's demystified and we'll talk about Beard Lambert's law and its application in anesthesia. So when we look at uh, the Beard Lambert's law, the intensity of uh, light uh, traveling through a known substance reduces proportionally to the concentration of the substance and the distance it travels through. So the absorption is equal to log 10 of the incident light over the transmitted light and is equal to a constant called the epsilon or the extension coefficient. And the distance uh, or the path it travels through and the concentration of the substance. Now let's look at these two laws separately. In the Beer's law, we have a, concent uh, a substance of known concentration in a beaker. When we shine a light through this beaker, certain amount of the light will be absorbed by the substance and the intensity gradient on the other side is reduced. Now if we increase the concentration of the substance, the amount of light absorbed is further increased and the recorded intensity is reduced further. So if you look at Beer's law, it states that the intensity of parallel beam of light decreases exponentially with concentration C. As the concentration of the substance increases, the amount of light absorbed is increased uh, proportionally. Now let's take uh, two beakers of different sizes but containing a substance of the same concentration. When we shine through a light through the first beaker, a certain amount is absorbed, the intensity of color is reduced. But when we uh, shine the light through the larger beaker, the amount of light absorbed is re uh, reduced further and the concentration recorded is much lower than the first one. And that's because the light has to travel through a longer distance. So Lambert's law states that the intensity of parallel beam of light decreases exponentially with distance or length it travels through. So in simple term, Beer's law relates to concentration. Remember beer, beer is alcohol, different concentrations of alcohol in different drinks. Lambert's law starts with L, it is a lengthy lane, has to do with uh, the length or distance the light travels through. Now let's look at the application of this law in capnography and gas monitoring. Now, these laws are used uh, in infrared spectrometry. Infrared spectrometry basically states that the interatomic bond between dissimilar atoms of molecule absorb radiation in the infrared range. So substances like nitrous oxide, which have two dissimilar molecules, carbon dioxide, anesthetic agent, which has got different molecules of uh, carbon, of hydrogen, of the bromide, chlorides, fluorides, uh, water, which has hydrogen and oxygen will absorb infrared light, but nitrogen and oxygen or helium will not. So if you look at the absorption spectrum of the certain uh, gases we monitor like carbon dioxide, it's maximally absorbed at 4.26 micrometer, anesthetic agent at 3.3 micrometers, nitrous oxide at 4.5 micrometers, uh, carbon monoxide at 4.7. Anesthetic agents are also absorbed at, at the further range at 10 to 13 micrometers, so 3.3 and 10 to 13 micrometer uh, range as well. So if you look at the gas monitors, uh, they consist of infrared source uh, which transmit uh, infrared light at 1 to 50 micrometer, 15 micrometer. And this light passes through a sample uh, ch chamber and it also passes through a reference chamber. Then we have a filter wheel uh, which rotates at a frequency of 25 to 100 hertz and it has got filters for carbon dioxide at uh, 4.26 micrometer, anesthetic agent at 3.3 micrometers, nitrous oxide 4.1 micrometers. It can also have a second filter at 10 to 30 micrometers and then the light passes through detectors and then the, the display. So the amount of absorption of infrared light is proportional uh, to the substances that are present in the sample. And we can see the absorption spectrum. But what is important is that in the range of 3 to 5 micrometer, the absorption spectrum of carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and carbon monoxide is very close by. And this leads to something called collision broadening. 
So the nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, anesthetic air, water, they all likely absorb the uh, heat and they can affect the absorption of each other. Uh, water uh, is present in abundance in our, uh, uh, in our breath and uh, that's why we actually have filters uh, for uh, not filters but uh, it's this, there is a chamber which actually collects the water in uh, in, uh, in the in this chamber which does not uh, go to the analyzers so which is taken off from this but it's not just the uh, substances which absorb infrared light that can cause uh, the uh, collision broadening and non-infrared absorbing substances like helium, argon, acetone, alcohol can also affect this uh, measurements. So we have to be uh, careful. Now, if you look at uh, heliox, uh, sometimes used in uh, patients with difficult breathing, which contain oxygen 79% helium, it also affects the capnography. Uh, capnography is going to underread if you're going to use uh, heliox uh, in these patients and monitor the carbon dioxide levels. Then we look at uh, another system that uses B. Lambert's law, that's pulse oximetry. So if you look at the pulse oximetry, there are two parts to pulse oximetry. First is the plethysmograph that measures the pulse. And then comes the oximetry, the, the saturation, which are, uh, we are very concerned about. Uh, well, that's what we look at. The pulse oximeter usually use two wavelengths, 660 nanometers and 140 nanometers. Uh, whereas the co-oximeter use a range of wavelengths, uh, so they're more than that, and they're able to uh, monitor the carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin. But with the uh, standard pulse oximeter, we only look at uh, oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin. And for the exam purposes, you should be able to draw this line. So what you do, you have a graph x-axis wavelength nanometers, absorption uh, on the y-axis, and then you uh, put down the uh, values for that, 600, 700, 800,000, and then you draw a tick mark. And then that is for oxygenated hemoglobin, and then a hills and valleys, and that is for the deoxygenated hemoglobin. Then you draw a line through 660 nanometers, that is the red range, so maximum absorption of the deoxygenated hemoglobin occurs here, and 940 nanometers where the oxygenated hemoglobin is, is absorbed. The point where uh, both uh, the absorption is equal is known as the isobastic point, and this is around 800 nanometers. So we all know that in a pulse oximeter, there is a probe. Uh, we sit across uh, the uh, thumb or the fingers, and uh, on one side we have the uh, source of light, uh, which transmit lights are 660 and 940 nanometers, and on the other side is the receiver. And this information is then fed uh, to the pulse oximeter. Now, how does a pulse oximeter give us that reading of 97, 98%? And that is very, very important. And to understand that, we need to understand something called AC and DC components. So when we look at the finger, what we have is that we have the uh, pulse style component, which comes mainly from the arterial blood. But the non-pulse style components not only comes from the venous blood, but it also comes from the other tissues. So light passes through this pulse style and non-pulse style uh, component, uh, and uh, this is detected. And uh, so we have the measurements at 660 nanometers and 914 uh, nanometers. And this is the raw transmission signal. What the pulse oximeter now does is that it need to equalize the uh, numerator or the DC component. So they are made equal. And then we look at the ratio of absorption at these two wavelengths. Okay, so. Uh, we look at AC 660 by DC uh, 660 and AC 940 by DC 940 and this gives us a ratio called absorption uh, ratio, the R. And this is plotted on a graph. And there we get the values when the absorption is around 0.6, we get a value of 97%. But when the absorption is equal, ratio is equal, we get 8, 85%. And this is very, very important. These values are actually drawn from volunteers. And because volunteers cannot be ethically desaturated below 80%, any reading below 80% is an extrapolation. 
and cannot be trusted. There's limitations uh, with pulse oximetry as some of them are safe. Uh, they can be because of mechanical art, uh, artifacts, uh, because of the movement artifacts. They can be from the interference, from magnetic interference, electromagnetic interference like diathermy. And they can be physiological. We know that if the uh, there is a shutdown, the uh, pulse volume is low or the rhythm are irregular, and then the saturation can be affected. But these are uh, safe limitations. Uh, but there are certain unsafe limitations we should be aware of. Like I mentioned, the calibrations occurs uh, using uh, the volunteers where they cannot be desaturated below 80%. Uh, so the accuracy below 80% 80, 80 is, is reduced. Uh, flooding and penumbra can actually affect. This is seen when you actually use a large probe in a small finger like in pediatrics. Uh, the uh, incident, the, the uh, ambient light can affect the reading and, and that's why we should uh, be sure that either the probe is covered or you use the right size probe. And then there are other physiological uh, limitations like uh, abnormal hemoglobins, uh, absorbance and pigmentation, dyes, delays and pulse style veins. And uh, some of this we're going to discuss a little bit. Uh, carboxyhemoglobin uh, overreads because the absorption of carboxyhemoglobin is in the oxygenated hemoglobin range. Uh, it is more maximum at 660 nanometers. Whereas with methemoglobin, uh, it depends on the level of methemoglobin. So if the uh, level of methemoglobin is, is actually very less, it will uh, tend to actually still read 85%, and that means uh, it is actually under-reading. Yeah, even though saturation may be around 93-94%, it's actually uh, under-reading uh, the saturation. <laughs> Whereas if the level of methoglobin increases very high, so if you take a, a sample and measure it, uh, the saturation may be around 82-83%, 80, but the uh, pulse oximeter will read, read 85%, because the absorption at 660 nanometers and 940 nanometers is equal uh, for AC and DC component with, hem with hemoglobin. So it tends to overread uh, when the levels of methemoglobin is, is very high. Fetal hemoglobin, skin pigmentation, bilirubinemia, they do not affect oximeter reading. And uh, the cold vasoconstriction, vasodilatation uh, that occurs in septicemia, they affect the pelth oximetry, uh, sorry, uh, plethysmography. They don't uh, affect the oximetry. Oxygenation, oxygenation can be still be ma measured. It may not be uh, giving a reading constantly, uh, but uh, they affect the plethysmography, not the reading of that. Uh, thank you very much.